Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to uh, spend a few seconds to kind of introduce myself and um, some of my um, interests. Uh, so I, I'm a professor at UC San Diego. Um, and uh, I kind of like to do research across a bunch of areas. I have published in compilers and uh, architecture. And I, as, as was mentioned, I, I worked on uh, MIT Raw Project when I was a grad student. And, uh, recently, I've worked on a processor called GreenDroid, which is sort of targeted to this dark silicon um, regime. And uh, in, in my kind of architectural explorations, I like to build chips. Um, and I, I also am, uh, in my spare time, like to read IEDM papers. Um, and as a result of some of that, uh, I ended up doing some work in uh, technology scaling. Um, and uh, kind of my role uh, lately has been to kind of take some of that work I did in technology scaling and uh, you know, kind of convey it to architects and try to build uh, models for architects as to uh, how they should be uh, trying to uh, focus on, on their research on... Excuse me, can I see you for a second? Yeah, thanks. Uh, focus their research on uh, kind of emerging challenges. Um, so... Uh, you guys have all seen this variant of the slide, um, but basically eight years ago, uh, we were in a uniprocessor world with processors running around four gigahertz. And uh, if you look at transistors today, those transistors are four times faster and 16 times more plentiful. So we would expect through simple math to have really, really fast processors and lots more cores than we tend to have on a, on a chip. And these numbers are much lower than, um, than we would expect. And so our kind of uh, product of performance is a lot lower than expected. Instead, uh, what we have is this dark silicon, right? So we have a, a lot of transistors that we could not we cannot utilize at their full frequency, um, and you know part of the challenge for architects is sort of first realizing that this is the problem, and then realizing that you know beyond the uh, you know initial efforts to improve just basic energy efficiency, we need to start thinking about the problem in a more fundamental way. Think about ways that we could fundamentally change the way we do architecture to address this, this issue of dark silicon. Dark silicon is basically all of these, you know, kind of transistors that we cannot uh, clock at their full frequency because of uh, power budget. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to start by uh, talking about something I call the utilization wall, which is our sort of uh, very simple way of expressing this, this concept of dark silicon and how it's going to affect architecture. I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of taxonomy that I created called the Four Horsemen, uh, which looks at, it kind of categorizes different promising directions that architects could have for dealing with dark silicon. And then I'm going to focus on uh, GreenDroid, which is a processor that we built at, or we are, are building at UCSD uh, that uh, tries to take advantage of dark silicon. And I want to note that there was a, a special issue of IEEE Micro that just came out uh, this month on, on dark silicon. Uh, Steve Swanson and I at, at UCSD were the uh, guest editors for this issue. And the, uh, most of the material here that I'm presenting is in, the, in the, one of the articles in the issue. Okay. So the utilization wall is, in, in, in short, stated as uh, with each successive process generation, the percentage of a chip that can switch at full frequency is dropping exponentially due to power constraints. And this thing, this, this really took a lot of effort to get across to architects, and they were generally very skeptical about this idea. Um, and uh, in order to argue it, we basically, you know, called in Robert Denard and uh, made the standard argument about CMOS scaling um, that, you know, yes, we get more transistors, and the transistors get faster, so our compute capabilities are going up by t about 2.8x per process generation. And, but in order to exploit these additional capabilities, we have to balance the equation in terms of power. And so the lower capacitance of the transistors is going to get us uh, part of the way there. And then traditionally, voltage scaling got us the rest of the way there. And so, uh, of course, starting in 2005, we didn't have this last extremely important lever for uh, managing the power side of the equation. And so, you know, the expectation that architects should have until the device people come along and save the day with new kinds of devices, um, is that we are uh, going to be able to turn on a very, a, an exponentially smaller fraction of the chip uh, at its full frequency with each process generation. And so as a result of this uh, utilization wall, we have this dark silicon. Okay? And from the architect's perspective, 
we kind of have this spectrum of trade-offs that we could make when we're scaling a, uh, a design uh, to uh, a new process generation. We can either uh, increase frequency and, and drop the utilization of the rest of the silicon area, or we can have, and that, that's sort of the maximally dark version, or we can have kind of intermediate points where we're just lowering the frequency and, and keeping more of the silicon uh, lit up. And indeed, we could even consider dropping the overall frequency of the chip in order to chase after parallelism. And in fact, there are some designs that are doing that, especially GPUs. Um, so that's sort of the, the utilization wall part of, the, uh, of my talk. Um, after you kind of think about the utilization wall, then the next question is like, well, OK, if dark silicon is a reality, then what are the kinds of things that we could do to take advantage of dark silicon? Um, and really, we want to develop a kind of more nuanced understanding of, of dark silicon and maybe what some of the approaches are for dealing with it. So that leads into the second part of my talk. So um, when I f sort of did my initial work on the utilization wall, I went around and talked to a lot of people and, and actually argued with them a lot. Um, and everybody kind of had their own uh, approach for dealing with the problem. And I kind of started to group these different approaches into a kind of taxonomy. Uh, so it's in a way a kind of taxonomy of arguments about dark silicon, where we, what the solutions are. And uh, so each of these, uh, I call them the four horsemen, and, and, and each horseman is kind of a, a, a way to kind of deal with a dark silicon um, world. So the hor first horseman uh, is what I call the shrinking horseman. And uh, this is the kind of the, the argument that I hear the most from active chip designers. They say, oh, no, dark silicon is never going to happen. I'm never going to just have parts of my chip that aren't lit up. You know, this is the, that's just silly. Because, you know, area is expensive, and that's just going to burn money to have, you know, stuff that's not turned on. And, you know, you kind of hear this a lot um, from chip designers because chip designers, you know, they often will start out with a fixed architecture, and they'll be targeting you know, a fixed area budget that they have to meet in order to keep the chip profitable. And so if they uh, overrun that bid budget, then the area does get to be very expensive. But in kind of the longer term uh, picture, uh, we do need to deal with dark silicon because it ties into the profitability of our chips. You know, it ties into the demand that we'll see for our chips and a lot of the kind of basic economics of kind of paying for the next process generation. So one of the common mistakes with dark silicon is people kind of think that, oh, well, dark silicon means this is just stuff I, you know, I ship the chip and there's just that part of the chip that's turned off for its entire lifetime, okay? And it's like, well, no, that, that's not what it means. It just means that, uh, you know, either it's sort of underclocked relative to what it could be clocked at, or it means that it's not used all the time. It's just used some of the time, okay? So there's a lot of dark silicon that's already there on current chips. Like, for instance, L3 caches are very dark. And those transistors do not switch very often. The duty cycle is very low. So a lot of this is really about duty cycle. Dark silicon is about low duty cycle. So just to kind of attack this, this question about the shrinking horsemen, you know, wh why could we not just shrink chips to keep them within the power budget? Well, there's a couple of issues. So a big one is power density. So we, we could shrink the chip, but the chip would shrink a lot faster and then we would actually want it to a lot more fast than the, uh, the, the kind of corresponding power density that we would want to maintain um, would allow. And so although we could shrink the, the, the chip to stay within the kind of system level power budget, the power, the power density of that chip would, would get uh, very high and the temperatures of the chips would raise very, very rapidly. Um, there's also an argument about uh, competition and margin. So let's say that you're building a chip and uh, you decide, I'm not even going to think about dark silicon. I'm just going to shrink my chip down to a smaller and smaller size over time to stay within that utilization wall. Then the problem is, is that if there's some other manufacturer that comes along and figures out how to actually use extra silicon, even if it's dark, to do something, then you're going to fall behind. You're going to be selling like kind of low margin product that's not going to be very compelling to consumers. Um, the other issue with kind of shrinking things down like this is that there's a lot of costs in the product that uh, aren't you know, related to the silicon itself. There's packaging and marketing and testing, and, and also I.O. pads are kind of an issue too. But with all of these problems of shrinking chips, we're still going to have chips that do shrink. There are chips where it actually 
doesn't really uh, benefit you to uh, have extra area. So maybe there's a fixed spec. Maybe it's a video decoder that has a fixed throughput and it doesn't really help you to have a higher throughput. Um, or it may just be that uh, you, know, you really can't even find any uh, new benefit to the extra resources. And those chips will kind of be left behind. These will be the chips that never advance to the next node. They just hang out at you know, 65 nanometer forever, right? Because the mass costs just don't really justify um, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the smaller um, area. Okay. So there is a little bit of a race to the bottom with these shrinking chips. You, know, the, it, it, you have a problem where if you, unless your volume for these smaller chips is growing, then your ability to amortize mass costs is going to be impacted um, in a very bad way, and the economics don't work out very well. But nonetheless, there may be some chips that are like this. Okay, so the second uh, horseman is what I call the dim horseman. Okay? And uh, here the idea is we're going we're gonna to try to keep chip area constant, uh, but we're going to uh, essentially uh, underclock them uh, very severely, or we're going to use them in bursts. So uh, in the underclock version, we might have all those cores enabled. And as we scale down, say, from 90 nanometer down to 8, you can see we get more cores, but then they sort of get, they're less and less lit up. Okay? So that would be the, uh, what I call spatial dimming. Okay? And then uh, I'll show you a slide for temporal dimming in a second, but the idea is that you're going to light them all up uh, a bunch, but just in bursts, and then you're going to let them cool down. So it's going to be this kind of burst mode operation where you, you light them all up, Chip gets too hot, you let it cool down. Then you, you do another burst. You light them all up, and the chip cools down. So uh, spatial dimming, um, we, we've seen a lot of this, actually, in, in industry already. Um, just conventional dynamic voltage and frequency scaling is, a, is kind of a form of spatial dimming. We can lower the voltage, and that allows us to use more cores. Um, Shaker mentioned near-threshold voltage operation. That's another kind of variant of spatial dimming. But kind of what's unique about it is that it's, it's using DVFS in a regime that people didn't originally think was particularly promising. And the reason is, is that as you lower the voltage and, and get more energy efficiency, the delay increase of those transistors is actually outpacing the energy savings that you get. So there's a gambit. You're slowing down the computation so you can get more energy efficiency, and then you have to make it up by finding parallelism in the, in the, in the code in some way and uh, recouping the loss of, of performance. Can and you tell us what DVFS is? Oh, yes. DVFS is dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So basically, uh, uh, you know, originally it, you could um, you know, reduce the, the voltage and, and uh, get a cubic power savings uh, with only a linear decrease in frequency. Okay. So, the, uh, so in, in the kind of good scenario of near threshold voltage operation, I might be able to lower the voltage and uh, basically use eight, say I lower the voltage and I get uh, 8x decrease in uh, serial performance, but I save 5x energy. Then I could use eight times as many cores to get the performance back. So I'm using eight times as much area and I'm getting five times x lower energy as a result. Or you could go even further and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take all this energy efficiency, I'm going to use way more cores and I'm actually going to get five times the performance with the same energy, but I'm going to use 40 times as much area. Okay. But the challenge is, of course, when, you're, when you paralyze things across so many cores, then you have a lot of uh, non-ideal um, speed-ups and non-ideal energy efficiency. You have additional work that you're doing in terms of communication and so forth. Uh, there's been a lot of active research in this area, and people built a lot of prototypes, like the Intel prototype that Shaker was mentioning. Um, and uh, some many core chips from uh, Michigan, and then some proposals for SIMD chips uh, that you exploit near threshold. So the other direction with dimming is to go temporal. So the idea is here on, on the, as we go left to right, we might have a bunch of cores that are basically off, and then we light them up for a brief period of time. So there's some kind of thermal capacitance in the system that we're able to exploit. And so we can, we can actually run those cores at uh, you know, a higher power budget than the steady state power budget until the uh, chip reaches some critical temperature and then we have to let it cool down. 
and then we can repeat the process. So this might be really good for uh, kind of some kind of bursty operation. So for instance, even in a, in a cell phone, you have this dichotomy of the active versus standby mode, right? Active is you're using the browser, and the standby is when you're trying to conserve energy. And there, you know, you're, you're, you might only be able to sustain four hours of that active uh, uh, use uh, in a day, uh, but the assumption is that you're going to have a lot of hours where you're not actually using your phone. It's just sitting in your pop pocket. More recently, we've seen um, temporal dimming, dimming where there's uh, much smaller time scales. So, uh, for instance, uh, Turbo Boost 2.0 has this uh, leverages the thermal capacitance of the of you know desktop and mobile processors, and basically uh, it allows the processor to jump up in frequency for a brief period of time until the the packet heats up, and then it will have to lower the frequency. We've seen recently another effort um, from uh, Michigan and uh, UPenn called computational sprinting, and there. They've been talking about putting a phase change material on top of the, the die, and then basically uh, you can uh, sort of over, overpower the processor until the phase change material, paraffin wax, melts. And then at that point, you have to go to cool down mode. So that will give you t temporary boosts boost of performance that would exceed the kind of steady state performance that uh, you would expect. And then uh, ARM's Big Little is also has this property where they have four very meaty cores, and then four kind of wimpy cores, and they can run, uh, say, when you click on something in your browser, they can run that on the media core and render the web page very quickly and then switch over to the wimpy cores uh, in order to uh, let the, the chip cool down. So that's the second horseman. The third horseman uh, is what I call the specialized horseman. Um, and there, the idea is that as we scale down in process generation, we get more and more heterogeneity in the chip, more and more diversity. And so we're going to be um, building all kinds of little specialized circuits in order to maximize the energy efficiency of any particular computation that we're doing at that time. Okay? And it's sort of well known that specialization can get you between 10 and 100x in energy efficiency. Um, so there's been a couple of efforts in this area, and uh, one of the efforts... Uh, is a project that I've been working on called GreenDroid. Okay. Um, and GreenDroid uses these things we call conservation cores. And what they are is they're just automatically generated specialized circuits where we basically take hotspots in the source code. So hotspots are regions that you spend a lot of time in. And we convert them into uh, you know, essentially Verilog and uh, build a multi-core processor that has these little cores, these conservation cores, um, injected into it. And we just sort of light up the conservation cores uh, that we need it um, when uh, we need them. So the, con the execution model is that basically the code is sort of jumping from conservation core to conservation core. And just for each you know, loop that you have, you're running the specialized hardware that's been targeted for just that loop. So we're kind of trading this relatively cheap resource area, which is, you know, a lot of it is dark anyways, for energy efficiency. That's the, that's the play that we're making. Um, and we have really focused on, you know, you might have heard of high-level synthesis where the goal is to generate hardware you know, from high-level languages. Our approach is, a, you know, it's kind of a high-level synthesis approach, but our focus is really on making sure that any piece of code be, could be turned into a specialized piece of hardware, whereas high-level synthesis is usually focused on taking code that has a lot of parallelism and turning it into hardware. And one of the approaches that we use to, to accomplish this is that if you look over that diagram there, we have the C core, which is the uh, automatically generated specialized hardware, and it actually sends all of its memory accesses through the data cache that's shared by a host CPU. And the model is, if it's code that's not executed very much, then it runs on this host CPU. And then when we hit this hotspot where we spend a lot of time, we jump over to this uh, specialized piece of hardware, and we don't have to transfer any data over there because the data is already sitting there in the shared data cache. Okay, so it allows you to jump back and forth very quickly and very efficiently. And the tool chain that we have that does this doesn't really rely on any of the very hard compiler transformations that are usually required to parallelize code. It's just a straight translation. You see a plus in the code, it turns into an adder. Okay, you see a memory operation, 
it turns into an input to a multiplexer that goes to that data cache. So it's a, a very um, kind of simple transformation, and yet it can get you about 18 times less energy. Okay, so just by turning it from code and software into circuits, you get 18x, okay, without even trying to parallelize the code. Okay, so this is sort of a, an overview of how this works. We take the code, we do very standard compiler transformations, we build a control flow graph, we build a data flow graph off of each uh, basic block, um, and then we have a state machine which in hardware which reflects the control flow graph, um, and then we sort of emit Verilog and then run it through a standard Synopsys IC compiler flow. So why do we save energy when we do this? Well, if you look on the left, this is the breakdown of energy for a very energy efficient uh, processor. And uh, on the right is the energy for one of these circuits that we generate. And the main benefit is that we're sort of getting rid of all the overheads that are involved in executing an instruction. We don't have an instruction cache. There's no fetching or decoding of instructions. There's no big register file for us to write operands to. And then even a lot of the data path is eliminated. All those bypass paths and little pipelines to sequence writes into the register file and stuff. All that stuff is gone. All that's left is the data cache accesses, and then a little sliver of the data path, which is the actual computation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump forward. I'm just going to briefly mention, so we've been applying this conservation technique, conservation course technique to uh, the Android mobile environment and actually extracting these hotspots from Android and then building a chip. So there, this, this uh, floor plan, which is the output of a layout tool, uh, basically shows you these nine different conservation cores clustered around a data cache and a, with a processor on the left. We have a kind of standard template, and we've actually been uh, targeting global foundries. We have a relationship with global foundries and their 28 nanometer process, and we're working on taping this out. So there's a bunch of papers you can uh, go check out on this. So I'm going to now wrap up with the fourth horseman, which uh, might interest a lot of you guys because it's the fourth horseman is kind of the magical intervention from God, right? Which, from the perspective of the architects, that's the device people coming along with a replacement for the MOSFET, right? So, um, so MOSFETs, you know, 60 millivolts for a decade. We're searching for things that are better. Um, the things that have appeared on the architect's roadmap are NEMS, um, nanoelectromechanical relays. They're basically mechanical switches that have been miniaturized. And TFETs have also appeared in our literature. And, you know, we're sort of eagerly looking for other things to, to spring out of the woodworks. Um, last mention here, DARPA recently funded this Starnet program, and one of the interesting things is you can kind of classify each of the centers into a horseman and, and what it's attacking, and you can see a lot of the focus of the DARPA slash Marco Starnet program is on the fourth horseman, these new devices, but there is some attention that's being applied to the other three horsemen. Uh, so check out that uh, micro um, issue, and uh, I guess uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for a great talk. Time for some questions. Yes, please. So this is uh, a big part of the uh, of the uh, dark silicon problem is driven by thermal management. There are thermal solutions that can handle a few hundred watts per. Uh, per square centimeter, for example, using micro channels in the silicon. And I, they're not very practical, they're expensive, but there are solutions. So why aren't we pursuing those and then uh, and dynamically uh, putting the cooling when and where it's needed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if your power budget allows you to, to do, uh, you know, micro channels through the silicon and stuff like that, then, you know, you, you should use them. Um, I mean, one issue is that, as I understand, that gets you to about 400 watts per square centimeter or something like that. So, that, so you're kind of it's it's not enough. You know, even there you'd have dark silicon. It would just be less less dark silicon. You know, you'd have a couple, you'd buy yourself a couple generations. With phase change, you can go higher. With phase change, yeah. So you know, in in some environments that 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 might make a lot of sense if you have like very latency driven computation. One of the interesting things I think is is you know, mobile definitely doesn't have the luxury of high power. But it's also interesting that, you know, at exascale you don't either because, you know, it's the tyranny of the masses. You have so many processors that it starts to add up. So there will be some kind of domain in the middle there. 
you know, I don't know, maybe high frequency trading, you know, where you need to respond very, with very low latency to some event where it would make sense to kind of supercharge things like you're saying. I think that's pretty interesting. Kirsten? In the context of the Energy Aware Computing Workshops in Bristol, I've asked a question regarding um, dark silicon, and in, I invited a neuroscientist because the brain isn't always on everywhere at all time. And there seem to be very interesting approaches uh, that our biology inspired to solve this, so that might be something that you might want to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, I, I was sitting in the back there cutting out the last 20 minutes of my talk, and there's some brain stuff, actually. And I had to squeeze it from 45 to 25. So uh, if you look at the, the, that paper, actually, at the end, I talk about maybe how s some of the architecture of the brain could motivate s some new design techniques for, for addressing dark silicon. Um, of course, I, I think it's important to say that the solution is not to simulate a neuron with silicon and try to save energy that way. You, we want to sort of take high-level insights from the brain. Yeah, but good, very good point. You like so ju just a comment on uh, one of the previous questions about just having better cooling. So let's say you had better cooling. There are other things that, uh, other obstacles that come in the way uh, and uh, that have to do with the ability uh, to deliver current uh, fast enough. And uh, so uh, if, it, if it weren't the power, it would be something else and you would still have your uh, four dark horsemen. Uh, but I was, I was kind of interested in the conservation one. Is it possible to imagine a conservation core that just does the browser, uh, another one that just does Microsoft Word? Is, is it at that level, or is it at a much lower level? Well, it, it, that's what we're working on. But it would actually be, uh, I mean, we have a study. I had to delete that slide, too. But we had a study that showed that, like, 7 millimeters of silicon and, you know, 22 nanometer would actually be enough to cover a very high percentage of the computation. Um, in, in your typical mobile phone. It, actually, things have, have, have evolved in the mobile space in a very favorable way. It's a, there's some statistic that like 40% of user time is spent on Facebook and 30% is spent on the browser. So if you get the Facebook and browser in silicon, you may cover a lot of the phone. It's kind of cool. Despite the fact there's supposed to be you know, a million apps available in the App Store, the reality is most of those apps people don't spend very much time in or they don't even download. So, yeah. Just a question over there. Uh, if they come out with uh, new browser software, can you still use the same C cores? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that, that was another slide that I had to delete, but we, we were working on a, basically a, a patching mechanism for the core. So we, we don't totally bake the, the hardware. We leave a little bit of reconfiguration in there. So if they completely change the algorithm, then yeah, you, you got to dump the C core. But there's a lot of changes that you see in software. We, we looked at how software evolved over a 10-year period and then looked at how we could change the C core so it could actually adapt to those changes and still remain relevant for new releases of software. But the answer is you definitely have to do that. Like it's the, the, the baked-in cores, if you don't add this reconfigurability, they're actually useless like on the next version. Uh, so you, you really do need that ability. Yeah, question over there. Okay, uh, if you can make it uh, a little bit reconfigurable, can you make it completely reconfigurable? So that uh, yeah. uh, maybe you can run anything in, in this core if you, you have an application which just needs a, speci a special code for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot of people ask that question, and you know, the problem is it's hard to get something for nothing. You know, so so that when you when you sort of specialize, you're eliminating all the extra overhead that you don't need, but other computations might need that, and so you you run into this problem where you know you, you you lose the benefits of specialization if you don't actually specialize so but it doesn't mean that there might not be other architectures that are better you know like for instance people have been looking at say coarse grain uh, reconfigurable architectures as one potential uh, different way to bake the processor to uh, to improve energy efficiency okay, there are a lot of good questions here we but I'm afraid we are out of time and thank you very much thank you